Welcome to Oleg Show. You are watching ALM TV. On today's episode, sheer surprised, non-expected reaction I had. I was just mm -hmm. jumping in my room and laughing like, "What the fuck is going on?" <laughs> on today's show, I'm privileged to have a really special guest: composer, musician, multi-instrumentalist, drum teacher, drummer, and music technology graduate from Pop and Jazz Conservatory in Helsinki, Ukri. Suvilekto. Ukri originally started to play electric guitar at the age of seven and later found himself learning to play drums by pure coincidence. He started his own YouTube channel back in 2007, which would later lead him becoming one of the first Pearl Drums artists endorsed by the merits of his social media success. He is a living proof of endless opportunities that internet provides musicians and artists in the 21st century. He has worked with many bands including Delirium's Order, Before the Dawn, Vermivore, Wolhart, Ea and Whispered, just to name a few. He also worked as a drum coach in the internationally awarded comedy movie Heavy Reisu. Ukri has also released two solo project records, where he composed all the music and performed on all instruments himself. Today he is a world-renowned music artist playing drums for the Norwegian black metal band Abat. With that being said, Ukri, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Alex. Glad to be here. Excellent. I think, you know, I was really looking forward to uh, making this interview because uh, I think your story is really inspiring. And uh, I'm looking forward to ask you all the questions I've prepared because I think for those uh, folks uh, watching or listening uh, to this interview, there's going to be a lot of insights that can, you know, help them uh, in their careers. Uh, and um, I think the first thing that kind of really um, got me hooked or interested about you is your name. Uh, you know, for somebody coming from Ukraine, the name that sounds Ukri is like a very, very familiar, like a very close kind of thing. Um, could you share a little bit about um, your name, the origin of your name and a little bit the story behind it? It's very interesting to hear. Yeah, so currently I, I believe there are 43 Ukris in Finland. Wow. So it's it's a very rare name. Um, basically, I don't have a name day in the calendar. So m my name day is basically during the name day of Ukko. I think Ukri is basically a variation from the original name Ukko which basically has roots in um, Finnish mythology. And of course, we also have these fenno ugric uh, languages and uh, people. Yes. And Ukko is the god of thunder, right? If I'm correct. Yes. Yeah. That, that's, that's amazing. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very old, uh, old kind of pagan Finnish god. That's God of thunder and the uh, weather and so on. So, do you feel like uh, does it help you in your daily life? Like, do you have some uh, kind of energy behind you? You know, helping you solve <laughs> day to day uh, things. Um. Well, I really think that my first name Ukri has helped me pursuing on my musical career. Because I, I believe it, it can really stick into people's minds because it's a unique yeah. name. Yes, it's very different so it, from the regular. Yeah, yeah. Names. And talking talking about you know the the roots or like let's say uh, the time when you started. Uh, I know that you grew up in the musical household, right, with your parents uh, playing music. Could you share a little bit uh, about that period and uh, who who is responsible? Uh, is it your dad or your mom for uh, basically you getting started in, in music? They are both definitely uh, responsible for me getting into music. I think they are the probably the main reason for me to get into music during mm -hmm. very young age already. So basically, my both parents they uh, they play various instruments. And um, my father is a music teacher. Um, my mom plays in various different bands and both are very talented and artistic people and by many means. Which instruments do they play? 
your, your parents? Uh, my father plays this um, old European instrument called lute. Wow. Mm -hmm. Also classical guitar, flamenco, uh, piano. My mother plays acoustic guitar. She's a good singer and also mm -hmm. a little bit of piano and violin. Wow. So, wow. That's that's yeah. a very diverse, uh, diverse background. And uh, obviously no surprise why you are also a multi-instrumentalist and why you play multiple instruments yourself. Yeah, uh, I agree. From, from from what I know is that your uh, kind of musical path started from the guitar, right? You started uh, playing guitar uh, and yes. uh, later on you switched to, to drums. So can you share a little bit this transition story? Because I know it's also quite interesting one, taking the context of your of your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So basically I started originally at a band class that my father was doing. I joined the class at age of seven, probably. And um, I was really passionate about electric guitar. I really wanted to get into playing ACDC and, you know, rock classics like that. Basically, how the story went that is that when I joined the class, there were three guitar players already. And uh, when the drummer left, I was basically given the sticks to my hand that okay you have to start playing drums i remember i i totally sucked at playing drums originally and um i was not really into it but then when i found metallica and metal music in general it really hooked me into playing drums and um i think i ha i still have the same connection nowadays that to me it's not so much about the instrument but about mm -hmm. the musical context Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the context, uh, was the rock music somehow part of your um, environment? Uh, like, obviously, like, let's say in your family, it's kind of very classical, very academic uh, sort of um, yeah, music yeah. environment. So where did the rock music came into, into the picture? Um, rock music basically came into the picture um, via my cousin. Mm -hmm. So my cousin Janne, he's an amazing guitar player, and he was also involved in the band class. And um, he basically introduced me into Metallica and ACDC and bands like that. So mm -hmm. that really got me into the heavier music. So we can call him out. He's responsible for your professional career, basically. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> So basically starting with drums was something that you didn't expect, but somehow you didn't reject that idea, right? You decided to go with it. So was it inspired, as you said, by the rock? So you heard what can be done with this instrument, right? In the context of uh, rock and roll music and that kind of got you inspired. Yeah, I think basically I, I wanted to play metal music. When I heard it, it was like this lightning strike in my head that this is what I want to play. And um, basically, mm -hmm. because my cousin was already then very good guitar player and me getting into playing drums, that really got me into playing, w wanting to play metal music in a band. So mm -hmm. it was not so much a question of interest in wanting to play metal on drums but wanting to play metal with a band right right so kind of having this context of people around you uh having this energy exchange in a way right and like feeling definitely. that you're contributing to creation of this kind of something yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that you wouldn't be able maybe to do uh, by yourself otherwise absolutely that's really the case Ukri, I've been very excited to ask you about your, uh, you know, professional career journey because uh, it's a pretty crazy and uh, inspiring story at the same time. Um, I know that you started uh, working on your YouTube channel back in 2007, right? Uh, could you share a little bit about that process, that journey, and uh, what was the pinnacle moment for yourself uh, jumping off from YouTube to your professional music career. This is a story that probably I never shared with anybody um, publicly. 
I'm excited a little. <laughs> yeah, I remember there was a huge hype going on with the mm-hmm. uh, upcoming Nile album. Mm-hmm. Thoughts from the Gods detest that it was mm-hmm. going to be released at the end of 2009. Mm-hmm. I was very active already on the drum forum of George Colias of Nile, who was back then probably the biggest musical uh, drumming inspiration for me. Mm-hmm. And I could mm-hmm. see that there was a lot of hype going on for the album. Mm-hmm. Then I found out the album had leaked and I, I was using the torrent Oh, and wow. I actually downloaded the leaked album oh, wow. a couple of weeks before the album was released. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Are, are they going to sue you for, for this? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> probably going to jail for this. <laughs> this is insane. So basically, uh, you got the chance to uh, hear the music before it was... Yeah, and um, it says a couple of days after the uh, album was, uh, was released, mm-hmm. I put out the drum cover, the cover on YouTube. I remember the first time that I heard the track mm-hmm. with 280 beats per minute blast beats. I had never heard that fast blast beats. Incredible song. And mm-hmm. it was really the combination of the amazing songwriting and mm-hmm. the unbelievable drum performance in mm-hmm. the song that really mm-hmm struck me like a lightning that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have to make a drum cover of this song. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Basically, before I started working on that song, my hand technique was in 230 or 40 beats per minute maximum. Mm -hmm. During a couple weeks, I was able to increase that tempo to that level of 280 beats per minute so that I could at least somewhat properly play blast beats mm-hmm. for those couple seconds that mm-hmm. are required to play that song. So, and when I was actually making the drum video and I was about to release it, I just had this strong feeling and this strong knowing that mm-hmm. I'm doing something terrifically right. I posted the video Next day, I see it's all over the place, which was crazy because Mm -hmm. I found the channel in 2006, Mm -hmm. age of 12, and Mm -hmm. uh, 2007, I uploaded my first videos. But Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd already been trying to get myself, put myself out there and get recognized. But Mm -hmm. before I released the video, I think I had around 100 subscribers and as far as I know, there were no other big medias or mm-hmm. social media platforms that yes. Yes. gave me that publicity for, for the video. So it was the first real hit mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the target group, the, right. the audience. Right. But it's also pretty interesting that even though I got very good recognition for the video, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would continue uploading drumming videos from then on until maybe six months later. Only then there was another video then that went viral. Yes. And all the other videos in between would mm-hmm. get maximum a couple thousand views. Would you still kind of follow that strategy that you had in the beginning that you would uh, release the video and then publish it in these forums? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So you had like a kind of trusting your gut feeling, right? Having this intuition yeah. for something, I'm, this is something I'm doing right. And also ha- having a strategy. So being smart about how you distribute uh, your content. Absolutely, absolutely. But I, I think six months later, that, was, that became the period when more of my videos started to get more recognition and Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. 2010 when i started to get increasement on the growing of my channel what was it about the same time uh 2010 when you were discovered by uh pearl finland because uh from what i know basically you were discovered through the internet through your youtube channel and then it led you to being endorsed and signed uh by pearl finland can you can you uh, share that that particular story this is one of the craziest stories of my life, honestly. 
<laughs> you know, I had been active on the drum forum of George Colias of Nile um, mm -hmm. at least since 2009. And um, mm -hmm. 2010, I was making quite a frequently Nile covers, which were one of the most recognized videos I was making. Mm -hmm. And um, I was also uploading the videos on the drum forum of George Colias. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember one day I just noticed that he had seen some of those videos and he was actually commenting and he was um, very positive with his feedback. Wow. He, and, he, um, himself, personally. Yes. Wow. But <laughs> during autumn 2010, mm -hmm. one day I was just... After school, I was crawling down my Facebook um, wall. Yes. If mm -hmm. it, yeah. And um, then it says, there appeared Pearl Finland. And there was my YouTube channel with the comments of George Colias. And there was a text from Pearl Finland. George Colias of Nile sent the link of this channel. Mm -hmm. um, to Pearl Finland, which was my channel, <laughs> and there were there were comments like Amazing. there were comments like this guy will slay in a few years, and I will also support him as much as I can. This guy is sixteen and he's playing stuff that only few people are playing, and I remember just the this sheer surprised non-expected reaction I had. I was just mm -hmm. jumping in my room and laughing like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> this is the craziest story I, I, I've ever heard. But this is so inspiring. It's kind of in a way uh, gives the, you know, example and hope to all the youngsters out there who are, you know, thinking about starting their own music path or, you know, getting started into music, that everything is possible as long as you put into work. Basically, I live in, in a countryside, uh, even currently in, in this very tiny village, small populated village mm -hmm. called Turnava in the northern Austro Bothia, um, mm -hmm. North, North Finland. Actually, right now I'm in the room where I filmed all this, all, all the drum covers in, okay. the, in the past. Wow, so historical. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> awesome. seriously, there were no other musicians in, the, in this village. Mm -hmm. that I knew. So I, I guess I proved that it's not the question of location that mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. in, that you can actually get yourself out there mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. the screen. Right, right. And this is insane. Is amazing. So, yeah, it's incredible. So what happens after uh, you see uh, yourself, uh, your video on the Pearls uh, page? What, what happens after that? How, how did the communication go? Who was in touch with you? And like, how did it grow from there? Basically, the head of Pearl Finland got in contact with me during that time. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was not obvious. George Colais, I don't think he suggested Pearl to contact me or anything, but George was a huge name already back then in the metal drumming scene. It really had an effect on that fact that I became a Pearl artist later on. So mm -hmm. I would get in contact with the head of Pearl Finland and we started talking about this possible endorsement deal mm -hmm. with Pearl. Mm -hmm. The guy, the head of the Pearl, Pearl Finland, uh -huh. he told that it was the first time that he came across somebody becoming a Pearl artist um, just by the merits of social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Insane. So, yeah, I was one of the first people to go to that path, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the age of 17, I was performing at a drum clinic with along with Kai Hato of mm -hmm. Nightwish and Winter Sun, mm -hmm. and also Heikki Malmberg of Diablo and Timo Häkkinen of Sotaimala. So Yes, insane. Was it already after you got endorsed? That event, that drum clinic where I performed was basically the moment that I got um, 
public with the endorsements. Right, right. Your first kind of public appearance as a pearl yes. artist. Yes. This this is this is amazing. And how did it go? What was your? Uh, do you remember what did you felt uh, that day? Like playing with this amazing uh, drummers, <laughs> joining the, the the event. Yeah, it was it was very good. Um, it was very different experience from anything that I had done before, but it was it was a very good experience. If you look back at this um, event or this experience, like you basically starting your channel in 2007, so I, I guess that was like your strategy in a way. So it was not like you were just recording videos and uh, it took off on its own, but you had like a strategy behind it, right? You were sharing it uh, to different uh, musical forums and it yeah. took you consistent effort for two years, basically, to get yes. that first traction and then having uh, uh, your favorite artist notice you and pass your your uh, demo or your videos uh, next to uh, Pearl Finland and then ending up in this clinic. It's like kind of this kind of um how do you say the consequence of uh the strategy in a way that you had so it was like well thought out um process like you were determined to to let the world know that you are the uh drummer right you're a musician uh, how do you think what was the biggest insight uh from this event for yourself personally what did you learn about this um opportunity and uh you know basically the the results that you got after spending so many years uh, doing this? Um, yeah, one of the biggest lessons, mm -hmm. so to speak, is just intuition, I would say. Trust your guts, right? Yeah, yeah. Because when I was starting, or even when I got noticed by a sort of larger, larger um, audience, I remember there were only so nobody really told me to start uploading my videos on YouTube or mm -hmm. any, anything like that or the other things to share the videos on other Trump forums or mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. start using different social media platforms so it was pure intuition. You just felt like this is something that seems to be the right thing to do, basically. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. So you didn't have a mentor. You didn't have anybody who would kind of give you advice. It was just a pure, pure intuition. Yes, at first I didn't have any mentors, but later on, um, I've had many mentors along the way at during certain periods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how do you find, uh, what is the importance of having a mentor? Do you think nowadays for young musicians, is it important to have uh, like this kind of guidance or somebody who can provide you with advice and with um, some suggestions or ideas? If you compare yourself having a mentor and before you got the mentor, because you still were able to get really, really uh, uh, impressive results. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, there have definitely been um, certain times that I felt that I needed a mentor to help with uh, certain things, but also because there were only a handful of people doing uh, going that path. We were basically some of the first people to discover that path. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, there were just things that you, you, I think you just had to find out yourself. Right, right. Having that persistence, right? That uh, trust in yourself that uh, you can do it and just, uh, you know, keep, keep doing what you, what you enjoy. Yeah, totally. This, this is really inspiring. I think for, for those uh, folks who are watching this, uh, especially, you know, youngsters who may be thinking about, uh, starting their career. Nowadays, the internet provides so many opportunities. You have so many of these new platforms and it's uh, kind of 
it's kind of a paradoxical thing and ironic in a way that it's much easier nowadays, right, than it was back in the days. For example, when you were starting uh, uploading your your materials, now we have much more of these uh, social media platforms and there is so much attention there. But at the same time, uh, everybody gets that uh, kind of uh, opportunity. So the market becomes saturated and uh, then it becomes the problem of how good you are, right? So you really need to be really good nowadays to break through. I agree, yeah. There is a level of production. There is a level of social media skills. There is a level of social skills. And I agree there is a huge amount amount of um, musicians who are making great quality content and uploading it, putting it out there. And it's, you know, it, it has its pros and cons. It's it's to- there are totally different um, different positive outcomes of the fact that there are a lot of great musicians out there, and you can connect with people mm-hmm. maybe with a b- bit more clarity than back in the day. Mm-hmm. Because there is just more information, right? So you can learn better and uh, get inspired in much more places than maybe you used to do it before. Yes, I I think Mm -hmm. probably most of the pioneers in anything are carrying the part of the responsibility of discovering those areas that have not been yet discovered. So... Nowadays, you can really find more information about different kind of route right. to right. Um, set yourself into into the motion uh, and reach, yes. reach your your, yeah. your potential. Uh, I yes. know that you are also uh, you've been involved in uh, several uh, projects outside of uh, basically music industry itself you also were part of the film industry uh here in finland and uh i wanted to ask you about the heavy race experience and and this film was released in 2018 i believe and it's the comedy film by uh director yuso latio and yukka Vitgren. and it tells the story of a small village metal band and its adventure on the way to a festival geek of their dreams in norway it's the first uh, Finnish comedy film to be included into the South by Southwest Festival program in Austin, Texas. And it was rated four stars by media outlets like uh, Helsinki Sanomat, uh, Kaleva, Amulehti, Savon Sanomat, and so on. It received, uh, I believe, six awards across uh, different uh, international uh, film festivals. I think uh, it was audience awards at the Belfast Film Festival in Ireland. Uh, I hope I spell it correct. It's a uh, Nordlink Film Festival in Netherlands. I, sorry for butchering the name. Uh, also Warsaw Film Festival uh, and a winner of the Fresh Blood Award at the Fantasy Film Festival in Germany. That's quite um, a big project. And uh, also, I believe, for the Finnish uh, cinematography and film space, it was quite important. And especially for music industry, because it kind of brings this question of, of um, a rock and roll on, on a whole new level, right? And uh, telling the story of Finnish, Finnish rock music to the world. Uh, do you remember how did you get involved into that project? And how was your experience working on it? Yeah, that, that happened in 2017 uh, summer. Basically, um, the film production of the movie was searching for a drum teacher. And um, one of the guys who had been working in the movie, he knew me as a musician. I was also back then located in Helsinki. So Mm -hmm. he recommended uh, movie production to contact me. So basically my job was not to teach the actors on how to play drums, but Mm -hmm. how to act playing drums. All right. Like the showmanship part of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh How how did that go? How, How was your experience doing this? Well, it's only about the sort of, kinesthetic uh, appearance and how it looks with the motions mm-hmm. of the 
playing uh, in different parts. Because the track, the soundtrack of the movie that I, I was giving the guidance for, that's a really heavy track with very fast blast beats. So right, right. there were certain things that also the editor of the movie and the director of the filming had to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, one of the details that I... I, th I thought it was a very smart thing to do in, in the movie is that some of the parts where they were actually playing this very fast double um, bass drum mm -hmm. patterns and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. blast beats, they filmed those parts from an angle, angle that it doesn't show the hands and the feet in detail. Uh -huh. So it actually gives this impression that he's just playing it right. <laughs> but... Uh, if you know if if you if you would see how he actually plays you could probably sense that there is it's not perfect or stuff like that so some some uh, unsynced unsynced yeah. stuff yeah. you know it, it's really interesting to hear it from you uh, like about this experience because like myself uh, shooting music videos i um, meet this um, occasion quite quite a bit with finnish drummers because they are so kind of very uh, concerned about the technic technic technicality of the performing and like okay we're doing music video but they want to make sure that they hit exactly uh, you know according to the um to the backing track and to make sure that everything is perfect though yeah. the nature of music video is a little bit different right because we already have the music track recorded yeah. but now what we are into looking into is the performance is the energy is the expressions is the yes. engagement with the audience with the camera you know with the bandmates so uh did you have those kind of um moments that you had to go through and like share with uh with the actors on, on set yeah i think i think that was basically the whole idea of that process mm -hmm. that i was involved mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. but as you described all these things, there are so many parts in the process that you can screw up in mm -hmm. uh, in the um, how the music video looks or mm -hmm. how it feels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that generally people have more ability for feeling if, for example, if something is off. Mm -hmm. you know, between the audio and the, in the video the scene. Mm -hmm. Maybe not all people can point out that this video is 20 milliseconds earlier mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the audio, but you can mm -hmm. actually feel it. So these are very important things in, in my opinion. Right. Uh, working on the film, uh, did you get to uh, be with the actors on set during the shooting days or you were rehearsing with them before? H how did that work, with this process? All of the work that I was involved was before the shooting. So mm -hmm. I would go with both actors uh, to my rehearsal space in Helsinki and go through the songs and basically teach them how to imitate the motions mm -hmm. that was my main job and i think it turned out fantastic it, and it's it's fucking hilarious movie <laughs> it is it is i i, I bet uh, what was the um, like the feedback uh, about the movie uh, i mean like in in finland in the professional uh, network right among the musicians and also i'm curious about norway right because norway is also part of the story there so uh, per, maybe you have an insight how the mu uh, movie was received basically in finland and in norway i may have met it's just one person from Norway who was familiar with the movie. But in Finland, I, I think generally everybody just loves that movie. <laughs> I, I think it's one of the best movies ever made in Finland, That, in my opinion. Right, right. Because it's, it's kind of very... Um... How do you say it tells uh, a true story about so many musicians that can recognize themselves in the main characters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You can really, so many people can really relate to that story and different exactly. aspects of that story. 
exactly. Like uh, usually coming uh, together in the garage, you know, like you hear the stories all the time from, from all these big bands that they started uh, playing in the, uh, somebody's basement or a garage and basically grew up uh, from doing that and, you know, starting playing live shows and uh, up to the tours and, and that's insane. So it, in a way, this, this film kind of represents a really uh, accurately the, um, how do you, the essence of, of coming up, right? As a music. Yeah, as definitely. Band. Yes. It is also amazing to, to see that, uh, like in general, the heavy metal music and rock and roll is so popular in the Nordic uh, like among the Nordic countries, right? Like Finland, Sweden, Norway, especially. Uh, how do you think uh, what it is about the, the heavy metal that makes people in the North especially admire it so much? One of the general stereotypes in, in that question is the weather, many months of darkness during the year in Finland. Actually, one of my friends, Joel Hocka from the band Plan Channel, who recently won the UMK uh, Eurovision qualification contest. He said in one of the interviews recently that there are notable differences in the children music between Sweden and Finland, for example. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, of course, you were asking about uh, Scandinavian countries. So yes, like no northern, northern. Yeah, I went to a bit different um, context. No, 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 it's okay. Please, co please continue. It's, it's interesting. Yes. But he said that basically children music in Sweden is a bit happier compared to Finland, where whereas we have more uh, melancholy in the music and the mm -hmm. melodies and harmony and so on. Mm -hmm. I have no proof of this, but uh -huh. he's claiming. Right. He, he just basically said that mm -hmm. um, it's in our DNA. I don't know. Maybe those uh, watching can agree or disagree with us in the comments and let us know what they think. But it's obviously interesting to to notice. I think um, there was uh, somewhere on the internet, there was a map showing the number of uh, heavy metal bands per capita in Europe and Finland is dominating, basically. It's it's like number one country yeah, it's in, crazy. in Europe to have so many. It's, cr it's heavy crazy. Bands. And I've been wondering of this question many, many times, but mm -hmm. I really don't have a analysis of this but um i would assume it, it has something to do with um, the general finnish character of the, the melancholy mm -hmm. that people experience in their lives i i heard like an interesting take i agree with you completely like uh the environment right and again the context that we mentioned yep. earlier several years ago i had uh, in, i took an interview with mick kayusela uh, from Finvox and uh, I was asking him basically the same question like uh, how do you think why Finnish people are so much into uh, heavy heavy stuff and what he yeah. said that he said that it's some um, kind of way a way for for people to uh, relieve uh, the energy that is accumulating in a way um, maybe because part of the Finnish culture that you are um, not uh, expressing all the time all your emotions right but rather you are yeah. kind of yeah, keeping yeah. it to yourself so yeah. you need to have an outlet. And, yeah, and it, it, it's like this kind of all-in-ones expression, so, sort of. There's also just the, the fact that metal music, especially some of the more, more extreme genres of metal, tend to have a bit more physical expression on how it affects people. Mm -hmm. So it's not says here what you experience but you actually experience the music with your whole body right. and right. you know mosh beats right. head banging right, right. right. It's, all very that physical. Stuff. So it's very physical it, expression right it, it's mm -hmm. very physical and mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. kind of primitive so almost tribal tribal very tribal yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's a very powerful way to um get in touch with your with your um, energy right, and your emotions. Right. I think this is like, this is a brilliant observation and I, I haven't heard this one uh, elsewhere. So thank you for this insight. It's, it's, it's indeed amazing when you start thinking about it, like what other genre of music allows people to get together and kind of uh, live this experience through physically, right? 
as you said, yeah. mosh pits, yeah. bang banging. It's it's the release of that energy in that kind of uh, tribal, my like uh, style. So, which other genre can offer that experience? Yeah, exactly. I think it was 2017 mm -hmm. or some of the year, some of the Tuska festivals a couple of years ago. Um, the, from of all the festivals in Finland, Tuska festival sold the most alcohol okay. and had the least amount of um, involvement with police. Okay, wow. <laughs> So I, I think that's very impressive. You drink the most and mm -hmm. basically the le have the least violence and right, right. stuff like that. So basically we can say that heavy metal music is like a legal way to uh, release the, 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 the violence out there and uh, still not go to jail afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's therapy. It's, therapy. it's totally therapy. a therapy. Yes, this is amazing. And also like looking into uh, like neighbor, neighboring countries like like Norway, for example, and obviously you have experience working with uh, Norwegian musicians also. It seems like um, uh, black metal especially is uh, kind of the business card of the country. Like you talk Norway and one of the few first things that come to your mind is like a black metal. What's your opinion? How do you feel why black metal especially is uh, such a big thing in Norway? That's a really good question. One of the aspects of black metal is the mm -hmm. connection to nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, Finland has amazing nature scenery as well. And a lot of the artists make music of that. I remember the first time I went to Norway. Mm -hmm. That was in the summer of 2014. I went up to the north of Norway uh, through Lapland mm -hmm. and when you start seeing all the mountains and the curvy roads and when you feel how small you are in the nature, just that energy and that emotion that I experienced, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I found relatable in the, the black metal music from Norway somehow. Interesting. So in a way, like uh, feeling your insignificance in front of the power of nature or its greatness. Yeah, and it's just... It was this very particular sensation that I had, something that many people experienced as well and were inspired to create black metal, basically. Right. Kind of uh, strategically sliding from, from, from that question, I would, I'm really curious to, to hear your uh, Abad story mm -hmm. and how did you come across the guys and how did you met the guys and how did you join the band? Um, well, basically, that story has a bit more connection to some events mm -hmm. many, many years ago already. But only later on, I could see that these certain events, which were not directly linked into me getting into Abad, were basically part of that path of getting into the band. 2017... I was contact, contacted for the first time to play drums for Abath, at least for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a period of time when the previous drummer of, of the band was not able to perform all the shows. So they were basically looking for a guy to step in for um, a fixed period. Like a replacement, basically, session yeah. musician. Yeah. The first time I went to Norway was in February of 2018. In between the, the time that I was originally con contacted by the band and the first time that I went to Norway, they apparently found a, another replacement already, but they actually contacted me again mm -hmm. at, at the beginning of 2018. And that was the time that I um, approved to basically play all the shows that they had booked for 2018. So there was a like an element of luck there also, right? In a way. There was, yeah, totally. There, there was a good timing. And mm -hmm. I think the previous ABBA bassist, King of Hell, who was also in, in the band Gorgoroth and mm -hmm. a few other re remarkable Norwegian metal bands, 
he found me from YouTube uh, originally. And then there was the previous drummer who also gave his recommendation. You know, he, he basically said that he subscribed to my YouTube channel in 2009 when I released my first video that went a little bit viral. That was the bleed by Meshuga. In Inumi as a musician since 2009. So eight years later, he gave me a recommendation for the band. Crazy. And crazy. yeah, it's, it's totally crazy. But also at the same time, I was so ready for that. I, I just knew that something was going to happen in that period of time because I, I just felt that I was really aligned to for that to happen in, in that time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it happened and here we are. Actually, it just became three years since I joined the band as a session guy. Yes. But journey continued on and mm -hmm. I became part of the official lineup and also we just recently recorded our second album. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, um, it's the third album of the band but third it's album. my second album yes so yes. and uh yeah. you mentioned you you've been doing it for three years already and i also know that it's the longest uh term that the drummer in abat was playing so you are basically the mo the longest living drummer in the band how do you explain that how, how did it happen it's definitely been a learning and growing process for everybody but i I personally feel that, you know, I, I joined as a session guy in the band and uh, later on became part of the official lineup. And actually the drummers before me, everybody was wearing the same mask, mm -hmm. which was part of the uh, image of the band. I was the first one who actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. came in, into the band as a uh, individual. I made it public in first sight when I joined or when just before we were starting our first tour together mm -hmm. that I was playing for Abbas and um, mm -hmm. I'm also at the album cover, um, album a booklet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just Ukri yes. in, in, in the band and on the album. Yeah, I've been, you know, I've been very happy with, with that fact that I was able to join the band as myself pursuing on my musical career. So to me, it was important to step in the band as a, um, on my own identity. Yes. Sort of. in, some, in some of the interviews, Corey Taylor from Slipknot, uh, when asked about this mask thing, right? In the band, he said yeah. that when you are wearing the mask, you are allowing yourself different things that you otherwise wouldn't allow yourself as a human. So it kind of gives you this shield that you can use to yeah. uh, hide your real self and then bring out that um, energy that is maybe stored somewhere deep inside you. I, th I think that's the case. Maybe not really hiding the real self, but mm -hmm. probably you are still yourself, but mm -hmm. you are allowing this other dimension right. to the surface that is maybe otherwise doesn't have a channel to... Right. This is also something that is universal in arts and music in general. Many musicians or artists are creating that art because it's their channel to express things that don't, didn't find other channels to right. be expressed. That, that's a very, very strong point. And I think um, in, in some of the interviews, uh, a, a famous Russian movie, a film director, Andrei Tarkovsky, who shot Stalker and uh, a bunch of really great movies earlier in the 70s, he said that the world around us is not perfect. So we as humans are seeking for this kind of artificial way to balance things out and the art and uh, music and uh, film or photography for that matter, art like painting, sculpture help us, as you said, find that channel and kind of balance things out. Like um, he said that if everything would be perfect on earth, uh, there would be no need for arts, right? But that would be very boring. <laughs> can you, can, yeah, you that's very... can you relate to that? Interesting observation. I can relate to many of that. 
Um, yeah. I, I remember the first time we got to, to talk uh, and uh, you mentioned this interesting fact that you somehow felt also the difference in the kind of uh, mentality between Norwegians and Finnish people, though on, on the surface, it looks like there are so many similarities, but what are the differences in your opinion or like major differences that stand out for you? <laughs> well, actually, if I remember right, it was actually you who told that all Norwegians get a little bit of a um, little part from the support from uh, the government. Yes. Yeah. From yes, the oil. Yes. Right. Exactly. As a, as a part of the, I think it's written in the constitution that as a citizen, you are the owner of the natural resources. And according to the law, uh, every citizen gets the share, a fair share from the sales of the natural resources in Norway. That's true. Yeah. So, that's an interesting insight at least mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know maybe they are a li little bit happier okay with that extra <laughs> bonus extra bonus <laughs> we, we should ask uh, norwegian people please guys if you're from norway let us know <laughs> does it yeah, make yeah. you more happy yes well i, I always felt very welcomed among mm -hmm. uh, norwegian people um mm -hmm. And it's actually interesting that many of the Norwegians who visited Finland, mm -hmm. they always had this, they, they always told they had this impression that they were really wel welcomed mm -hmm. or very openly mm -hmm. um, communicated with. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I feel also in Norway. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's just small differences like uh, usually having a bit of small talk with somebody who is working at a grocery store, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. small talk even in those places which barely ever happened in Finland. In, in so. Finland, right, right. Now, being a performer, right, like going on the tight tours, uh, like on very tight schedules and like performing uh, day to day, right? Because we all know how, how touring goes. It's like very, very intense uh, and also very stressful, changing places, changing locations, uh, being in the bus. Um, how do you relax or how do you decompress um, or how do you find that balance? What, what helps you to stay sane in that highly intensive environment? When you are playing this kind of music for five weeks mm -hmm. straight, mm -hmm. um, it's very demanding mentally and physically as well. And it's really important to find um, channels to balance out yourself. So, right. um, you know, last couple of months mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been, I've been practicing meditation daily. Um, it's something that I've been doing more or less frequently at least last couple of years. Right. And of course, playing drums is meditation for myself um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway, but the, some of the techniques that I work on um, in daily life, they are just um, find out to be very beneficial for my performance on tours and right. Right. overall well being. So, right. Uh, this is actually a very important topic that is probably not uh, talked so much about in the industry is the mental health, right? And uh, the, the coping mechanisms, the ability to uh, kind of uh, resist towards the stress because the, tour, the tours are usually highly intense uh, events and you are on the bus every night and you're going to the new location each day. So it's kind of uh, a lot of pressure and stress that you are going through. Like uh, for yourself personally, uh, how do you release that stress after you leave the stage, right? So you were just in the midst of the, in the eye of the uh, thunder, basically, right? The, the hurricane. And now you are stepping back, you're going to the bus. Like, how do you detach yourself from that stage presence? And how do you calm yourself down? How do you relax? Um, I think over time, it's just something that my body and my mind naturally sort of uh, develop this mechanism that I can actually 
sometimes I go from zero to 100, um, but most of the time it's from 100 to zero mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's about aiming to be in charge of your performance and your um, on your stress level and actually um, controlling your system. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what I've been trying to develop. Yeah, is it like, do you have some kind of rit rituals or some exercises, some things, maybe meditation that you do on tour to help you relax and like calm, the, calm down? I think on tours, one of the most important things for me to do is just find those small moments of isolation and mm -hmm. being able to just relax, mm -hmm. breathe in, breathe out. Just to breathe. It doesn't... Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything particular, but mm -hmm. having a small, uh, short walk, mm -hmm. um, because it's really it, it gets really intense on tours. The lack of private space, you know. Right. Um, looking yeah. at your professional career now, uh, for many many years, how do you think if you uh, had to start from zero today, right? Um, how do you think, uh, based on the whole experience that you've gone through, what would you do today to kind of kick off the music career? What would you recommend to somebody who is just starting or thinking about, you know, getting into music industry? Focus on finding your own voice and your own expression artistically and musically. If you are authentic in your expression, it doesn't really mean that you are doing something entirely different than the others. Mm -hmm. But if that authenticity in your um, artistic expression is something that you can see and feel and hear, that is going to be relatable. Mm -hmm. People can relate to authenticity in music. Mm -hmm. So search for your own voice work hard and um, make connections with people. Um, Networking. You know, if you're, yeah, if you're mm -hmm. starting from zero, it's really important for, for you to um, build up that network and mm -hmm. to um, put yourself out there. Right. Usually nobody's going to pick you from home. So, um, Mm -hmm. It's important to put yourself out there and also not to be afraid of failures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th those are very, very important uh, insights. Working with uh, so many different bands and with high, perform high performance or high performing artists, right? People who were able to build a name for themselves in the industry who have been around for many, many years. Uh, how do you think, uh, what are the kind of uh, main uh, personal characteristics of these people? What unites them um, psychologically or maybe some traits of their character that stand out to you that you can say, I've seen so many high performing artists and there are certain things that I recognize in each and every one of them that seem familiar to me. Can you think of maybe two or three uh, personality qualities that stand out to you when you think about high performing high, high performing artists in the music industry. Yes, uh, persistence. I don't know if that's a. It's a very good quality and a very important one. Mm -hmm. um, persistence, um, not being or not restrict restricting yourself due to being afraid of failures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also sheer expression of right. your own um, voice, I would say. Right, right. Those are very powerful, powerful insights. Basically persistence and uh, not being afraid of failure. I think we are uh, oftentimes taught to kind of um, not fail. Let's say in school, 
right? Uh, if we are uh, getting bad grades, then we are instantly getting this image of a failure or, you know, a dummy or something. But in the real life, it's the opposite. It's, it's like the, how, uh, your success can be measured by number of uh, mistakes you've, you've made in the past, right? And each mistake kind of provides you insight and learning lesson to kind of improve next time and do something better. So basically uh, kind of maybe encouraging kids not to be scared of mistakes, but rather embrace them and uh, learn how to treat them in the positive light. Yeah, I think some of the failures you do in life can be some of the most fruitful events of your life when you uh, transform that failure into growth and um, mm -hmm. yeah, just growth. <laughs> you are working on your own material uh, in the midst of all the, you know, touring and playing with uh, these amazing uh, musicians and bands, you're also creating your own music. Uh, could you share a little bit about two EPs that you've recorded and uh, where do you get the inspirations for your personal music? And uh, wh what are your plans for, for the future for your solo, uh, solo thing? I think that maybe sometimes I have been mistaken as a musician of giving that impression that my drumming or musicianship is mm -hmm. all about technique or technical performance. Right. What I want to bring with music is emotional experience and um, relation to energies that music is bringing to people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what I aim with my solo project and with these two EPs that I have put out is expressing myself artistically as wholesomely as possible because I'm basically making everything by myself. Both EPs that I put out, I perform drums, guitars, bass, vocals, also the um, the synths and orchestrations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and composing production, uh, some of the mix, uh, some of the recording as well. So when you have that ability of mm -hmm. playing mul multiple instruments and writing music, it really gives you opportunity to be in charge of what you want to express with the music. Right. Okay, so you're not only playing drums or guitar in, in a band. Right. It can be a very difficult process and mm -hmm. you may end up restricting yourself because you get too attached to certain ideas or mm -hmm. um, certain sounds or arrangements or, or whatever so it definitely has its pros and cons right can you name uh, all the instruments that you used for recording the two eps of, of yours yeah i think it says five instruments that i used on mm -hmm. on the that are recorded i mean that i played yes i played electric guitar mm -hmm. bass drums also vocals and um the other stuff I programmed on a computer. Um, but as you ask about the future of my uh, solo projects, yes. you know, I've been making an album for many years already. And um, I just accept the fa fact that it will take its own time. But um, mm -hmm. there will be a time that I, I will actually release my new music. The musical instrument that I bought um, the last time was sitar that I purchased last year, mm -hmm. finally, after a couple of years of being very intrigued in the musical instrument from yes. India. Um, yes. That's something that I definitely will involve in the upcoming music that I'm making. This is very interesting. And I was about to ask you about sitar. Uh, um, wh where does this fascination with uh, with uh, traditional Hindu music come from? So obviously you, are, you, you you've been traveling quite a lot. Is it just from pure curiosity, or you heard it somewhere and you loved the sound? Uh, how did you got introduced into into this music? Maybe some of the first times that I ever heard sitar was hearing uh, a Metallica song wherever I may roam, around age of eight or nine probably mm -hmm. i don't think i knew the the name of the instrument back then but it was something amazing but it, it really stuck into my head so that's definitely one of the aspects 
Um, but already on my previous solo EP Suvereis that that I put out mm-hmm. in uh, 2013, I was already then exploring with some of the uh, virtual instruments libraries of uh, traditional instruments. I think I was already using some virtual sounds of sitar on my last EP, but um, eventually I started exploring a lot of these virtual instruments libraries yes. with a lot of traditional sound, uh, instrument sounds from from the uh, East, um, mm-hmm. particularly mm-hmm. from India. I was traveling in India for two and a half weeks in, at the beginning of 2019 after we actually played a festival, Bangalore Open Air, right. Right. Uh, with Abad. So I stayed there just traveling by myself for a while. I went to this uh, ancient city of Varanasi where I was taking sitar, sitar lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, From a local guru. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was this this old guy mm-hmm. who had been playing sitar for 60 years or, or something. Amazing. And um, that was when I got my first touch into the instruments. So I, I think I took three or four lessons there. Mm-hmm. beginning of 2019 I promised mm-hmm. myself I would get a sitar someday sooner or later so last year I finally got myself one and uh, mm-hmm. I've been studying that a little bit right well this is uh, this is a very first of all very beautiful instrument and uh, you have uh, very nice recordings also on your Instagram with uh, sitar just I, I believe jamming uh, the playing and also I think that um, the the how do you say the nature of your music of your personal music your personal material is all is kind of very um, how do you say um, it's it's more about as if I can put it this way about intuition and about this inner energy it's 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 about maybe like a journey personal journey or personal exploration that's how I see it uh, would you agree with that? And uh, what do you think is the most important message that you would like to uh, share with your personal music? Well, thank you very much for getting the message that I have been trying to send with my music. It's definitely about creating emotional spaces rather mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. making compositions or arrangements that are just cool. Mm-hmm. to play or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, creating this wow effect right you know? even though there are a lot, lot of technical stuff in my music but it's it's just part of that exploration into those emotional spaces that i'm trying to bring into this world so um i would say that what i'm trying to bring some of those things that i gave as an advice for musicians who would start from the zero ground. I I mentioned finding your unique Mm -hmm. um, expression. So that's something that I'm pursuing with my own music, definitely. This this is this is amazing. Uh, can you share with the viewers how they can find your EPs, uh, where they can listen to them, and where they can uh, you know catch up and follow up with you on your uh, upcoming releases? Yeah, definitely. So the first EP that I put out in 2010, I released as an uh, with the artist named Psychosi, and and the next one I release with my family name, Subileto. Mm-hmm. Writing those names on YouTube, you can find both. Also, you can find the Subileto EP, Suveresta, from Spotify as well, and also from Bandcamp if you want any higher quality audio. I, I will link up uh, those uh, links under the in, the in the description of this video so everybody can, can follow and, and check it out. Sure, and for the updates of the future of my project i I will definitely make um make updates on my social media channels that basically my main channels nowadays are um instagram facebook and youtube so Mm -hmm. this type of you will find me on those platforms right 
Well, I, I can't wait myself to hear uh, the new materials and, and see your upcoming productions. Uh, your music is, um, as you said, it is emotional and it is about, uh, in like how I see it, it's about exploration of yourself. It's um, kind of uh, trying to learn about yourself and, and find those um, uh, channels to, to, to share it with the world. And it's, it's really beautiful. And I'm wishing you good luck with, uh, with the material and uh, let it come out at the time when it should. Um, what would you like to ask uh, from all our viewers or listeners who will be listening or watching to this interview later on? Uh, what are you interested to, to know? You get to ask the question of the day or question of the show. Uh, what, what would you like for people to answer? <laughs> That's actually a very surprising question already. So you can you can, what, you can ask anything. Who are you? That's a very very good question. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, write down in the comment section and share <laughs> share with us who who you are and uh, do you, have you found your uh, authentic voice? Uh, especially yeah. relating to our conversations uh, about uh, music. Uh, Ukri, I uh, thank you so much for your time, for doing this interview. Uh, it was amazing to talk to you and I'm wishing you all the best with your upcoming projects. Uh, as said, I will link up all the links to your socials and to your uh, music in the description here so people can go follow and uh, join you on your musical journey as well. Thank you very much. Alex, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks for having me. That's it for today's episode. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe to Ukri Suvilekto's social media channels to follow up on his music adventure. If you got any value from this episode, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. I'm Alex for the ALM Studios. Till next time, stay strong and don't forget to keep it rock and roll.